Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Innovation Center Speaker Series. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with the Innovation Center, uh, we're here. We're part of the University of Nevada, Reno, and we're here to um, serve our entrepreneurial community. We have co-working spaces, makerspace facility, and we also try to provide a connection to other university resources. Uh, the purpose for our speaker series is really to provide a forum for, with local entrepreneurs uh, to discuss issues related to innovation and entrepreneurship. And today we are very fortunate to have a panel of women entrepreneurs uh, who have started a business that not only is selling products uh, to consumer, but also provide an online community to really connect their customers with shared need or interest. And we have panelists, uh, Julie Arsenal, who is the founder and CEO of Penny Drop, uh, Sydney Larson, the co-founder of Lilybird, uh, Lauren Stowell, the founder and CEO of American Duchess, and Ray Shirley, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Hide and Mounts. Um, I would like to start off by having uh, each of our panelists to talk a little bit about uh, their company, what products uh, does your company offer, and what motivated you to start your company? Um, Julie, maybe we'll start off with you. Sure. So yeah, um, Panty Drop is women's intimates for all sizes. So we carry extra small to 6XL um, and basically realized that the future of uh, lingerie and intimates and really apparel in general, um, although we focus specifically on intimates, is, is plus size and, and size inclusive. And that's because two thirds of women in the United States are, are actually larger than an extra large, but they can't go to Victoria's Secret, for example, um, since Victoria's Secret stops their, their size there. So we really saw um, a lot of weight bias and size discrimination in the fashion industry and so wanted to kind of flip that on its head and create a brand that celebrates women at all sizes. Um, and so that's what we um, that's what we've been working on. And uh, we actually are having a pretty exciting day. We actually just launched our very own panty line that we've been designing. So we started carrying other brands and this is our very first uh, foray into our own design. And it's launch day, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> launch seems like it's going smoothly, so I'm excited to join all of you. Great, well, congratulations. Um, and Sydney, um, do you wanna tell us a little about uh, Lilyberg and what motivated you to start your company? Sure. So Lilybird is a subscription service for women. We say women in midlife and beyond. So typically our customers are, are 50 plus uh, for products that those women don't want to buy in the store. And we are focused currently on products for bladder leaks, which is something that is extremely common, but of course nobody wants to talk about because of that embarrassment factor. Uh, the inspiration to start the company really came from family members, especially my co-founder's mom. And from there, as we started to talk to so many women who experience bladder leaks, uh, we, we just started to realize uh, that, that there was a lot to be desired in the process of finding the right product and purchasing these kinds of, of products. So uh, we really exist to provide a much better customer experience um, around, around purchasing these kinds of products. Great, thank you. And Lauren, you have a very unique company about period fashion. Tell us about um, what product you carry and what motivated you to start your company. Um, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, my company is American Duchess. We make new old shoes. So we manufacture footwear from the 16th century to the end of the 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, the reason I started the company is because I just couldn't find those types of shoes. They're really specific. And uh, historical costuming was my hobby. So I, footwear was was the thing that you can't really easily make for yourself. Believe me. I tried. <laughs> Lots of people try. Uh, we provide shoes for opera, TV, film, theater, historic reenactment, uh, anybody who likes to play dress up, um, balls, picnics, really anything that includes uh, dressing in oldie timey clothes. And we've been going since about 2011. Great, thank you. And Ray, um, you also have a really interesting uh, mounts, uh, I mean, store that sell all sorts of mounts. And I've learned a lot through your website. I didn't think there was any mounting solution for some of the products you're developing. So tell us about your product line and what motivated you to start your company. 
Um, well, my company is Hide It Mounts. We started in 2009, so we've been around for a hot minute. In fact, I think that we started before most people were actively wall mounting their TVs. And unlike the, the common automatic thought, we do not currently make TV mounts, although that has been uh, a bone of contention for some time. And I do think it will be coming in the next couple of years, but um, not tomorrow. So um, otherwise, we make mounts for pretty much everything that plugs into the TV. So game consoles, cable boxes, media players, all of that other stuff that, you know, you, you mount your TV and you think, oh, great, we can get rid of this big bulky cabinet. Well, then what do you do with the rest of it? And that's kind of um, how we started. Um, we had a need ourselves. And so we couldn't find a solution and made it. And when I say we, um, I founded the, co uh, the company with my husband. And now we're looking at just continue expansion. So we're actually um, now making mounts for sporting goods and not really sure what's coming next. Great, thank you. So I wanna spend a little bit of time and talk about um, things that are, I think are both characteristic as well as unique to specialty e-commerce. Um, Julie, we'll start with you. Um, one of the things, uh, growing trends about e-commerce is personalization. And um, I know you carry third party brands, but you are launching your own brand, uh, which is great. Um, but, um, you know, Petty Drop also provide uh, personalized product offerings through style, color, uh, preferences. Tell us how you gather consumer data and be able to provide that personalized um, um, product offering to your customers. Yeah, so per personalization is such an interesting topic and um, there's, you can go really, really deep on it. Um, and I think, uh, so basically what we kind of started with is we knew that, um, or we started with this hypothesis that underwear shopping isn't fun. And so if, if we could kind of take the shopping part out of it and yeah, at least it's not fun for, for some number of women, right? Some people love it. I personally am one who does not. Um, so, you know, if we could take the shopping aspect out of it and you just got underwear that you loved on your doorstep and you didn't even need to think about it, it that would be perfect, right? And so then the question became, okay, how do we deliver that experience? Well, you know, there, each woman has her own preferences or things she likes and doesn't like in her underwear. You know, we have different amounts of back coverage, different fabrics and colors that we like. And so then the personalization aspect came into, okay, what are, what aspects of this really matter? Um, and then, you know, how can we create a fun and useful way for us to collect that information from our customers and so that's what we created with the preference quiz we've gone through a lot of iterations on the preference quiz it, it, you know the original preference quiz was two questions and you know it, and then it you know went up to about 20 questions and now i think we might be back down to around 10. um but uh and so that was sort of a, a fun and engaging online experience um i think we're seeing a lot of trends right now around these quizzes um people enjoy taking them and so it kind of it can be a good actual tactical lead funnel on your website to help get email addresses from visitors that you can then continue to follow up with. Cause it's, you know, people say it sort of takes seven touches with your brand or your business before someone actually purchases. So um, you ought to be collecting those emails for sure. Um, but yeah, so the quiz fun, you know, has some real tactical meat behind it, but then also really helps us with the personalization aspect. And so I think that's a good example of like how we've been able to use personalization in our business, but I think it has to be really, really customized to um, the situation that you're, or the, the goal that you have, and in a way that um, is relevant for the customer as well. Because I think you can kind of go too far down the personalization realm and get too techy with it. Um, and then it starts to lose the actual value in the customer experience. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Sydney, um, you have a, um, well, first of all, kudos to you to trying to build uh, your own brand because uh, it is, uh, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of competition out there. There are consumer giants like Procter & Gamble that has established national brand. Um, so why did you decide to build your own brand and uh, how do you hope to compete with these established uh, national brands? Yeah, building our own brand was was really, um, and that was one of the sort of cornerstones that we started with, um, where we felt like there was an opportunity for innovation. So um, the a couple summers ago, there was a there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I can't remember the exact headline, but it, it was something like one in three women experience bladder leaks, only one in ten use bladder leak products, and so. 
Bladder leaks may be very common, um, but uh, you know the large national brands um, that are owned by big companies like Kimberly Clark and Procter and Gamble clearly still haven't really figured out how to access um, customers and how how to get women who really could use these products to to um, you know improve their lives. Um, you know, these companies haven't haven't quite figured it out. And so our our belief is that it really all gets down to the customer experience. And part of that is part of that is the brand, certainly. Um, and you know, our brand is very accessible. We use humor. Um, you know, we're not laughing at you, but we're you know sort of bringing levity to the situation. And we get so much wonderful feedback from our customers on it. Um, you know, it's not boring. It doesn't make you feel old, uh, which these products and these brands often do. Um, and uh, yeah, and like I said, it really gets down to the customer, the customer experience, because at the end of the day, nobody wants to be, you know, sort of wandering in the incontinence aisle or taking that product to the register where they maybe interact with that cashier on a regular basis. Um, so our innovation is in, you know, you don't have to go to the store, the product is delivered to you. Uh, we have a variety of shipment sizes. Uh, we can essentially tailor your shipment schedule to be anything that you need so that you, know, you have enough products, but you don't have too many. Um, you know, our brand is modern and accessible, like I mentioned. Um, and then I think one of the most important things that we do is that we start our customers with a trial package. And so um, they're able to try 10 products for $1.99, um, you know, very, very low commitment and, um, and make sure that the product works for them. So they don't have to buy, you know, a huge bag of products and then use one or two and realize this is not the thing this is not the thing for me. Um, so it's, it's all, I feel like all of our, all of our innovation and, and um, our, you know, sort of art of our edge uh, in, in competing is around um, keeping the customer really front and center in what we're building. Great, thank you. And, and, and that customer experience and, and customization and, and, and personalization really um, are all, um, um, part of this sort of like you're not just shopping but you are actually part of that experience sort of the the you know the there's actually um a marketing um effort that is out there a lot of com company employee to really help with the shopping experience so thank you um so lauren um you have a very very unique um niche specialty marketplace and because you're talking about period fashion which is really trend of the past so how do you find uh, innovation or, or how do you decide what new product offering you want to have from season to season? Because it's not about fashion trend going forward, but it's about fashion of the past. Yeah, we, we often say that we are fashion backwards. But <laughs> even with uh, sort of these stagnant styles um, that, you know, something from the 1850s isn't going to change, there are still trends within the community and what people are interested in making and wearing, what events are happening, not this year, but in the future, hopefully. Uh, you know, is there a big event at Versailles? Is everybody gonna be wearing 18th century dress? Did a new season of Downton Abbey come out? Everybody's gonna be wearing 1920s clothes. Uh, so we try to latch onto those trends that are happening in our direct community and we also keep our ear to the ground with trends that are happening in the more mainstream. For instance, right now, cottage core and sort of this old fashioned style is a little bit mainstream adjacent. And we've capitalized on that hugely this fall with our fall release. Uh, it, I mean, we saw just exponential growth just by following that trend. It doesn't mean that we dilute what we do, our style, the look of an American Duchess shoe to try and, uh, please everybody we still stick to you know what what we do best but it definitely helps to not ignore uh what people are telling you they want so there's a lot of asking we do a lot of polls um, and a lot of listening and reading of what's going on in our community and also the greater fashion world yeah great thank you yeah uh, again listening to your customers um and and on personalization um i noticed on your web that you actually provide tools uh, for customer who wants to personalize their products by dyeing fabric shoes or painting their leather shoes, or how to move a button so that they can fit their shoes better. 
And uh, so tell us a little bit about that personalization. I think that's, um, you know, something I think that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a maker community. Um, most people are making the dresses they're wearing, uh, they're making hats, they're making accessories. And so wanting to personalize your shoes it was always a big thing. The very first product we made was a dyeable satin shoe, just because there was nothing like that available um, in an 18th century style, which is really very specific. So we offer, we uh, well, we used to offer the paints and the dyes. Um, you can get them a bazillion places online now, but it became more about educating people on how you can use these things to really customize your your products, um, how to decorate in this way, how to strip the finish off and paint them in that way, how to use dye, how to move the buttons, as you say. It, it helps us in customer service, um, particularly with things like how to move the buttons on a pair of button boots, because that is the historically accurate way to make a product like that fit. That's how they did it in the 1890s. Um, but that is not how people really expect their shoes and and boots to work today. Um, we've had some interesting experiences where customers have reported back that a shoe repair had no idea wh what to do with moving buttons. They'd never seen button boots. Uh, we are the only company in the world that makes those because of the fit uh, challenges with them. And so the shoe repair wouldn't do it because they didn't, they didn't know how to do it. So we have to educate the customer on how to do it. Most of them know how to sew. It's a really easy thing to do, but they're very nervous about you know, cutting the buttons off the $250 pair of boots they just bought. So there is a, a, quite a bit of, of hand holding, and we do see it come back in, for instance, sales of shoe care products, um, all of the work that we've done over the years of how to care for your leather shoes to make them last longer, uh, which is, is a customer service overhead for us if we have stuff wearing out because it was never cared for. So it, it behooves us to get on the YouTubes and the blogs and everything and, you know, here's how to polish shoes. And then we see an uptick in the sales of shoe wax and luster cream. So it kind of proves itself. It does help. Great. Thank you. And Ray, um, so you have a lot of innovative mounting uh, equipment. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, I learned a lot from looking at your website and including things I didn't think it could be mounted. So how do you find your product innovation, um, your aspiration for product innovation? Um, well, for us, I mean, for many, many years, it was really just driven by um, customer requests. And, um, you know, if we get a large enough request for something, then we'll make it. Um, that's how we delved into making mounts for cable boxes. Um, what we found is that there's a lot of different size of cable boxes. So making one that fit all was um, for a couple of years, a, a heavy focal point. Um, and that led to our universal mounts, which are a bit of a catch all for a wide range of devices. It's really just size based. I mean, if it's more or less a box shape in, you know, a media player type of or cable box type of size, we have something that will work. Um, but, you know, as far as you know, how we continually find it. I mean, we're obviously on um, the technology side, so we're having to pay attention to what's trending, what's popular. Um, I could say that when when smart, smart speakers first got popular, uh, probably about three, four years ago now, um, everybody had a smart speaker. And so we kind of were like, oh, this is like, everybody's going to go gangbusters with smart speakers. Like we need to pick them all up and make them out for all of them. Well, if you notice, there's only a few that really survived and thrived um, through that entire trend. And so we unfortunately learned the tough lesson that sometimes just because a device is made doesn't mean it necessarily warrants a mounting solution for it. Um, but on the flip side, we initially, when we launched the original um, PS4 mount, we launched that probably a year after the PS4 launched because we had our universal mounts and thought, you know, it works, it works. But that wasn't a, a viable solution for gamers that wanted to display it. And so we're right on the cusp, cusp now of um, several major uh, console launches. And so 
that's definitely pretty much taking up all of our time. Um, but besides that, it's customer requests. And now that we've delved into sporting goods, sometimes it's personal need. You know, I, I have a bunch of the supplies that I need taken care of. So I pretty much attacked my garage and went, okay, we need them out for this and we need them out for that. And okay, here we go. <laughs> so Great, it's a mix. You. Yeah, and I think if your product is riding the wave of technology and uh, with technology products these days lasting, you know, on average 18 months, it is quite a challenge and uh, I'm trying to keep that up. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to jump into a topic which um, I think is really something that is um, not only shared by all four of you, but fairly unique. And, and that is how do you create this specialty marketplace where not only you're selling product, but you've created an online community like an affinity group, um, in some cases like a support group, where people can, uh, with a shared need or interest, can really uh, talk about something that's very personal, like buying underwear or incontinence products. Um, and um, so Julie, I wanted to um, start with you. Um, so you have this blog called Private Parts. And yeah. in it, um, you have a lot of stories and women sharing their story about their difficulty of uh, buying underwear, and uh, you also go into women's health. And tell us a little bit about this online community and how has this online community you know, helped your business um, or fulfilled your mission? Yeah, um, so I think in a number of, of ways. So we knew that, we know that we have a very passionate and engaged audience and we know that they're looking for opportunities to talk about some of the issues and topics that matter to them. And I think as a brand, we sort of recognize that we have an ability to create a space for that in a way that, for example, just a regular clothing company, you know, probably like doesn't always make sense, right? So we can, we can talk about topics that are more related to sexual health and wellness and gender identity and, and stuff like that in a way that would probably not feel um, on brand for a regular clothing company, but they're still really important topics. Um, so I think that was one of the ideas behind creating the community. Um, you know, I think we also recognize that, um, so I think from a brand mission perspective, um, you know, it's, it's 100% there. Um, in terms of how it, it's, it's helped the business, I think um, there's a lot of ways for that. You know, certainly there's, I think, um, you know, the direct sales impact of it. And, and yes, like, you know, we do see the community driving sales. Um, but I, I also think that there's, um, you know, even from a, like a product research perspective and having a customer council, like that's, you know, a group of people that again are really engaged with our brand. So when we were doing, you know, fit testing for the perfect panty and we got sort of our first production run and we wanted to get, um, you know, our, our, we had started with like four fit testers, right, of, of, of a couple different sizes. And then, you know, next group, we wanted to go a little bit broader. And, you know, within that group, within a um, hundred, or sorry, we got like a hundred people into the beta, um, you know, within the first hour. Um, so just, you know, I think there's lots of different ways that that can help, you know, certainly direct sales, but also just um, helping to gather more information from the people who are your closest customers. Um, and, um, I think there was something else that I was going to say there, but, um, just, yeah. Um, do I remember what it was? Wasn't that important? <laughs> well, no, I, I think also what you have provided is a safe environment uh, for people to talk about things that they may not otherwise find uh, an opportunity to express and, and that, that safe and inclusive environment. And I think it's, it's, um, really needed for a lot of the customers out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thank Agreed. you. Um, so Sydney, and um, um, you have a blog site called The Chirp. Uh, I love that name, by the way. And, uh, and, and it's a site that's devoted to the health and wellness uh, wisdom for savvy women. And um, there you have blogs about incontinence, other related medical issues, nutrition, fitness. Um, so tell us a little bit about that online community and how has it helped um, your business and or fulfilled your mission? Yeah, I, I think like Julie, it's very much in line with our, our mission. Um, you know, Lily Bird is all about breaking the, the taboo and the stigma associated with bladder leaks, but also sort of everything having to do with the female body. Um, you know, we're telling customers you aren't old or broken or alone. And 
part of breaking that taboo is really um, educating women on their options and empowering them to make whatever choice is right for them in, in sort of you know managing bladder leaks or other um, related health issues. So the the chirp is certainly a, a big piece of that. Um, we you know we run articles every week that are about bladder leaks or or other topics like you mentioned, um, and I think I think the reason one thing that's I think interesting about the chirp is that you know at the end of the day Lilybird makes money when we sell products um, which are pads and underwear for for bladder leaks and. Um, and yet at the same time, our blog is talking about all sorts of other things that you can do for bladder leaks, you know, various surgeries or exercises. And um, I think on, you know, on the surface, that may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but the reason why we do that is because it's such a big part of our brand to do what's right for the customer. And what's right for the customer is to realize that there's, you know, there's really no silver bullet that works for everybody in terms of, you know, managing or, or eliminating bladder leaks. Um, and even for one individual person, um, often, um, you know, an individual woman will try sort of multiple things or, or need to do a, a variety of things to kind of, you know, manage, uh, manage the bladder leaks. Um, so, so I think for us, you know, the, the blog and our social media really go back to kind of doing the right thing for the customer and, and smashing, you know, smashing these taboos. Um, and, and the other piece that really ties in to there, which actually goes back to your last question, I think a little bit as well in terms of like innovation relative to some of the large brands is our, our customer service team. Um, we have a phenomenal customer service team and they're, you know, they're very hands-on and sort of making sure that the customer wants, um, they're, they're in our Facebook account, you know, responding to comments quickly, answering questions. Um, you know, if a customer has a need, like, maybe they need a product that's covered by Medicaid and we can't do that. You know, they, we will, our customer service team will refer them to a company that does. Um, and that is, uh, customers really appreciate that. You know, they, they can tell very quickly that, you know, we have their needs um, at the core of what, of what we do. And so I think in that way, all these things very much tie into our mission. Great, thank you. Um, and, and Lauren, I'm turning to you. Um, you have a blog site that educate people on period fashion, from textile to sewing techniques to hairstyles, and and with beautiful photography, by the way. And so, um, and you also created um, uh, a community uh, of, of books and patterns about period fashion. And you've written two books about period fashion. So tell us about um, your online um, blog and community and how has that helped your business uh, or fulfill your mission? Or in this case, I think really your passion as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, we actually started with the community first rather than the product. The product came out of the community. Um, I was blogging in 2009 about, that's when I started American Duchess as a blog, just chronicling adventures of sewing and figuring stuff out. And it was a, the hot thing at the time for like everybody to have a blog about whatever their hobby was about. Um, so I was blogging for two years before we ever introduced the product. And that's how I, I landed on the product. So footwear, like I said, it's not something you can really easily make for yourself, despite many people trying. And there was definitely a lack of it in, in our world. Um, so I identified the need for it. And it, it was not the first product I tried. Like I failed hard at trying to sell stuff to people that just t-shirts and ribbon cockades and handmade paper and dog coats and all kinds of things before I finally figured out that it has to be something that people really actually need and want and are willing to pay for that they can't easily make themselves. And that's still true today. Um, we are very, very active in the community because it's important for our brand to be a cheerleader of, especially of people who are coming into the hobby, who are new, who don't know all of the historical accurate stuff already. And so we had a saying a few years ago, of all roads lead to American Duchess. So even if our first point of contact with a newbie is a blog post in which I recommend printed cottons from the 18th century. It has nothing to do with shoes. I don't even mention shoes in the blog post. Like 90% of our content is, has nothing to do with shoes. But they learn 
about our company and our mission and our ethos and our passion. And they are supported on social media by comments that come from, well, it's mostly me doing social media now, um, again, but anybody who's in, on the customer service team cheerleading them and then they go, Oh, and when it comes time to buy their shoes, they're going to buy them from us because we've established the trust relationship because it's more than just transactional. It's, it's about working together as a community for everybody to be their best selves, however they want that to be, whether they're dressing up as uh, a cosplay character or they're dressing up in period fashion, uh, going to Colonial Williamsburg, whatever that mission is, we want to be there to help those people to, to make that come to fruition. And if they happen to need shoes along the way, which they definitely will because they can't make them for themselves, then we'll be there, standing there with the, with the shoes for them to buy. Right. Thank you. Um, and it is interesting, actually, you started the blog first and then product came later. And eventually you had to find something that people need and willing to pay for. So thank you for sharing that insight. Um, so Ray, um, you have also a great blog site that really educate people about different types of mounting equipment. Um, you share customer DIY stories, home organization tips, and really inspire people to uh, redecorate their homes. So tell us about your online community and how has that helped your business? Well, really ours kind of furthered by the simple need of having um, imagery to work with. Um, you can only create so many different setups. I mean, it, it is a little bit invasive. You have to put holes in the wall um, and I can only make a living room look different so many times. In fact, I've, we've been through several different um, furniture sets in our office showroom and it's really challenging just to make it look different and still be able to provide the different vantage points and informational imagery that people need. So um, we did it out of pure need to get more imagery um, and we created a photo contest that um, has proven to be one of our um, one of our best I think marketing choices because it not only provides us tons of content to work with but um, it does enable us to have a consistent flow of new and different um, information on our website um, on our social media platforms it gets everybody involved they're excited they get to show their stuff off I mean especially within the gaming community it's like a total thing to show off their setups and um, we've helped to establish kind of a new way of doing that um, and a new style of setup um, and so that, that's really kind of how that grew on um, from a blog stance. I mean, I love how much information you guys all provide within your respective industries. Um, for us, we, we try to kind of touch on that on the outskirts, but some of it gets a little bit technical where, um, we're careful not to provide too much information because now we can put ourselves in a potential liability situation, but, um, we do try to really just share those customer testimonials and those customer situations because we are pretty much a DIY solution. Um, and so, you know, there's not much to it. I mean, screw it in the wall. It's really not that hard. Um, we had to spend a lot of time educating though, um, because shockingly with how long people have been wall mounting TVs, they really think like, oh, you can't do that with this or that device. And so we spend a lot of time educating. And again, having those customer um, images and reviews to fall back on, we're just the company that's, of course, we're saying this or that because we're promoting our product. So it really helps a lot to have that customer information. And, you know, from there we've expanded and we've got, you know, influencers that we've helped them grow their, I wouldn't say influence, they're more micro influencers that we've helped them grow their following. And so they're super engaged and they love the products and we really try to support them. And there are ambassadors out there really helping to push the brand and um, engage with the community and, it's really odd, but like those, those bent pieces of metal, man, people like it a lot. So we're just lucky, I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you. So uh, I learned a lot from watching your DIY videos. So um, uh, inspire me to think about how I want to redecorate my, my, my own home. Um, I want to shift gear a little bit and really talk about um, the role that e-commerce play in, in today's economy. Uh, we know e-commerce uh, continue to um, disrupt retail. 
And, uh, and this disruption um, has perhaps accelerated during the pandemic uh, with a lot of the small brick and mortar business closing their doors. You know, I was driving around Reno last weekend, um, three of the stores um, that I knew had been there for years uh, are closing their doors. And so, so businesses that wanted to really um, get into this e-commerce um, uh, path or maybe want to create an e-commerce channel to complement their brick and mortar business uh, or create some sort of omni-channel, uh, what advice do you have uh, for them to get started um, you know, with a low budget and what are the uh, technical issues they have to deal with, platform issues? Um, Julie, um, I'll start with you again. Just sure. advice for, for brick and mortar um, businesses that wanted to get into e-commerce. Yeah. Um, so I think um, the first thing, you know, setting up a website, um, Shopify is great. Um, I think for probably 80, 90 plus percent of e-commerce stores, you know, it's a great place to start. So if, if you're looking like, how do I get into it? Where do I host my website? Like, just go to Shopify. Um, I think um, the other thing that's really important is um, probably your email list. Um, so acquiring customers online can be expensive. Um, so I think that's one of the advantages, like, you know, one of the advantages of brick and mortar uh, pre-pandemic was that, you know, you could capture foot traffic and you could be in like a central location, like a mall or a shopping area. And, you know, people would see you and they'd maybe stop in and, and check you out. Right. And that's a little harder to do online. Um, and so what you end up having to do is, you know, think about growing organically with your existing customer base, but then also paying for traffic too. And, and that can get quite expensive, um, which if you're trying to start out with a low budget is going to be hard. So I would say, you know, starting with your existing audience, your existing customer base um, and getting their email addresses, like that's probably going to be one of the most effective early um, channels to drive purchases. So um, think about, you know, MailChimp's pretty good for that. There's a few other tools out there that I'm sure everyone on this um, panel is using a different one, or maybe we're all using the same one and that's fantastic, but I, yeah, there's a few out there, right? So email, like start your website on Shopify, think about how you can build your email list and leverage that email list to build that online relationship with your customers if you're, if you're no longer going to be seeing them in your brick and mortar location. Great, thank you. Sydney? I, yeah, Julie mentioned a lot of the things that, that I... Um, would would fall in my uh, bucket of advice as well. Uh, start small. Think about everything as an experiment. Uh, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just sort of start something, see how it goes. Um, I think it's easy to be overwhelmed by a big change like that. So you know, just focus on on baby steps. Um, I also would say start with your existing customers, and also would say that Shopify is is very easy um, to get started. Um, and I guess to, to just build on what Julie said a little bit about uh, online advertising, I think Facebook advertising in particular is extremely powerful. And I mean, Facebook basically knows everything about us, <laughs> whether we want it to be that way or not. Um, and so in some ways that has leveled the playing field in terms of advertising. But uh, we found that you know, it's very time consuming to manage Facebook ads well, um, to be able to have a reasonable acquisition cost. Um, it, it's complicated. And it also takes Facebook time to kind of learn who engages you know, with your brand and buys your products. Um, so that would be something that, that I would encourage people, you know, maybe you do Shop, the Shopify piece website, et cetera, that's pretty easy to do on your own. But when it gets into online advertising, um, that's, a, that's a much steeper learning curve where I would probably encourage um, people to kind of look, uh, look for help, look for experts um, to, to help on that front. Great, thank you. And, and Ray, I'm gonna go to you because I know um, high, high demand products are uh, sold on Amazon. And uh, so tell us why you decided to go to Amazon. And Amazon sometimes is referred as the friend for small businesses or maybe foe for small businesses because the fees they charge. But they do provide a lot of the infrastructure, and especially if you wanted to expand your marketplace internationally. So tell us your experience with Amazon. Why did you choose to sell on Amazon? Grace, how much time we, do we actually have? <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time to really dig into this, but um, we've been on Amazon since 
pretty much the beginning. So, I mean, I want to say maybe 2010, 11, somewhere in there. Um, and at the time, it was kind of a natural transition to go from, oh, we're, we've got an eBay store. Now, let's go ahead and get an Amazon Marketplace store set up. Um, that was before Amazon was quite the behemoth that it is now. And so, you know, talking about, you know, 10 years ago versus now, I think that's a very different conversation in terms of what I might suggest. Um, in my experience back then, Amazon was the means to an end because people were not yet fully comfortable and bought in on shopping online. I think post pandemic, that is going to be something that we're going to see a major, major shift in where we've already been seeing the shift. But I think that now suddenly that that concern and issue with comfort level shopping online has dissipated and people will be actively shopping online now. But in 2010, they were not. Um, they wanted that, that guarantee that, he, you know, it wasn't just some fake website that was going to go and steal all their money. Um, and so it was a necessary thing at that time. And it did give us some visibility. Um, but generally speaking, now our brand is such that we probably drive more traffic to Amazon than the other way around. And in fact, people going to Amazon and searching for Hide It Mounts has created um, knockoff brands for us that we are now competing with. So, um, you know, there's definitely an ugly side to being on Amazon and it certainly depends on what your business is. When you're the first mover and shaker, there's people going to come and follow. But um, Amazon is another great resource to sell product, um, but it is, it is that double-edged sword. And when it comes to the time expense, as Sydney mentioned, yes, Facebook advertising takes a lot of time to manage, um, but so does Amazon. Amazon is extensive and, um, you know, like they just took listings down for us the other day. Actually, I was out of town last week and they took down listings on our PS4 slim mount, whatever. It's a mount. They're p bent pieces of powder coated metal. It got taken down for a hazardous materials warning because it had a battery, which it does not have. This is after this product having been listed on Amazon for, I don't know, four years. Like, why? Just out of nowhere, take it down, week before Prime Day, thanks a lot. So things like that happen, and um, really dedicating a fair amount of time to selling on Amazon is an absolute must now. Um, the amount of time that we're still spending on it is brutal, and um, there are companies that you can hire, but then with the margins, them taking over 40% if you're selling through um, fulfilled by Amazon, it suddenly just starts to become a game of, can you actually hit the volume numbers to make any money? Um, and then you're competing against really inexpensive products. So it's definitely a double-edged sword. However, it is a more popular shopping search engine than any other. People that are searching within Amazon are ready to buy. So not being on there is an opportunity cost as well. I don't have a good answer on it. We have products that we're not putting up now because of competitive reasons. And, you know, we're second guessing some of that and now deciding some of them we're having to push up because we would like to recoup some of those sales. Thank you. I, I think the, 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 the pros and cons of uh, selling on Amazon, I think that discussion is going to be ongoing for quite some time. <laughs> Um, so Lauren, turn to you. Um, you have an international marketplace, right? So not only Americans are interested in period fashion. There, I'm sure there are a lot of Europeans and Asians that are interested in period fashion. So, um, so what platform do you use, and why did you decide to uh, to do that? To use that platform? Uh, we just upgraded in August to Shopify, um, and I cannot say enough good things about it, <laughs> especially from a marketing perspective. We were on OpenCart for most of our history. Um, my partner is a web designer, so he he liked the bespokeness of OpenCart and being able to control every little bit of that. And Shopify, way back in 2011, if it even existed, it, it was very, very limited. But as we've gone through the years, what we found, at least from my perspective, the marketing perspective, is the shopping on Instagram, the shopping through Facebook shops, which are they're actually now the same thing, uh, connecting up um, the social media to the store, was just breaking with 
open cart. And that's where Shopify really, really excels for all the marketing is once we implemented that in mid August and I got all of the sales channels hooked up on Shopify, the Instagram shopping, the Facebook shopping, the, the link in bio through my Instagram scheduling app, which is I use later for that, like everything just plugged in. It was amazing. It was all plugged in in one day. Our sales just went poof, like right up through the roof because I removed barriers to, to the, the conversion. And that's massive. So uh, to add my two cents into the amazing advice that was just given about uh, brick and mortar stores going online, from the social media uh, perspective, I would say get on Shopify because Shopify is a supported platform. Uh, Chris, my partner before, he was having to fix every little issue with open cart whereas shopify you pay for it it's a subscription but it comes with a team that just fixes that stuff all those security things that happen on a constant basis all those little tweaks and broken things and updates and all of that are fixed for you with shopify so you you're essentially hiring somebody or rather not hiring somebody, an engineer, to to manage all that for you because you have this support team and they're very, very responsive. So get on Shopify, get an Instagram account going, and get a Facebook page going. So those two are, they're all connected together. If you have the bandwidth for it, start a YouTube channel. YouTube right now is the number one driver of traffic and conversions on our website. It's absolutely huge. If you can't start a YouTube channel or you don't have those skills, and I completely understand that, work with the influencers in your community on YouTube because it's definitely the new media. It is hugely influential. That's what I would recommend for bricks and mortar. The last thing would be take good pictures of your products. It's absolutely essential, even more so online. We've had issues over the years where the photos I took of the of like black shoes, you couldn't really see the details in them. And so the conversion wasn't very good simply because they're black shoes. You can't really see what they look like or I'd have to pump up the contrast and it would give an, uh, an inaccurate view of what the color of the shoe was. Like it, take good pictures of your products, please. It's really, really important. Um, that's one of the biggest mistake that I see bricks and mortar who move online do is they don't really accurately represent how awesome their product is. Uh, if you can do a video turnaround, if you can do eight different views or 12 different views, if you can have them, if it's clothing, somebody should be wearing that clothing for sure. Um, on foot photos of shoes always convert better than not on the foot. Uh, lifestyle photography is really important. Um, Grace, you complimented my photography earlier in this panel and it's, that's 10 years of trying to just sell the noodles out of our product by showing it being worn because you would think people know how to wear the clothes or they go, okay, well, you know, I want this pair of shoes or I want this hat or I want to wear this, this vest today, but they, they do need help in showing how it's going to be worn or how it could be worn because people are always looking to redefine themselves or express themselves through, through dress and through clothing. I have totally forgotten the original question you asked me. <laughs> No, that's great. In fact, um, you mentioned a couple of trends that I think is really uh, um, important to, to highlight. Uh, one is um, um, sort of the mobile shopping, right? If you look at millennials, uh, they're shopping on Facebook, they're shopping on social media, they're shopping using um, their mobile device. Mm -hmm. So mobile shopping is definitely one trend. And, and the other trend is uh, how, how we shop in terms of the, what media do we use to shop. Um, instead of reading a bunch of description, people now shop with photography, right? So Pinterest is successful because of that. Now, you know, the, the trend is moving toward video shopping and uh, essentially video that can make things more dynamic. And so absolutely what you mentioned is, is that the way we consume media when we shop uh, definitely is moving uh, to more of um, a visual experience, uh, both in terms of photographs and as well as videos. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanted to encourage people to um, submit your question in the chat room. Um, I do have a couple more questions for the panelists, but please do um, suggest, uh, I mean, uh, uh, put question in the chat room. Um, so just one, one, another question um, for you guys are related to starting an e-commerce business for those that are brick and mortar and, um, and you know, using the platform, dealing with payment system. But what about logistics? Um, if you use uh, fulfillment by Amazon, Amazon handles a lot of the 
the uh, logistics, but you got to pay for it. Um, and so logistics is an issue. So especially in light of the pandemic, uh, I know people have to, uh, challenges with inventory management uh, as well as delivery services. So if you could share with us some of those challenges that you've experienced and how have you dealt with those cha uh, challenges. And Julia, uh, I'm going to start with you again. Um, challenges associated with inventory, uh, delivery, or anything related to logistics because of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just need to collect myself for a second. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's fun. So we do our our fulfillment in house, um, for various reasons. Like we, um, you know, because we had such a highly customized product selection, um, like with an actual person reviewing the customer surveys and then choosing, you know, the items that go into a customer's order. Um, it wasn't something that we felt like we could easily outsource. Um, you know, I, I think if you're, if you have like a more stable product catalog and maybe a more traditional buying flow, it's probably easier to, to outsource, but we kept it in house. Um, and part of that was because I always saw fulfillment for us because of that experience as really a core part of the product. So I, I kind of wanted like our team to feel like if it was painful, I wanted our team to feel where it was painful. So we could think about how do we better engineer our processes, our product experience to, to account for that. So we decided to keep it in house. I don't think we'll keep it in house forever. Um, although integrating with, um, well, again, Shopify is actually really good here, right? Cause we didn't go through this experience, but I think the process of actually integrating with a third party logistics provider to do your fulfillment um, can actually take a significant amount of time technically and um, process wise. And so that's why I think using a Shopify because various fulfillment providers are already hooked up to Shopify. So then you don't even need to worry about, you know, what can be a multi month and tens of thousands of dollars, you know, consulting integration project there. So again, another plug for Shopify. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, there's sort of like this maybe spot in the middle where fulfillment and logistics becomes difficult. Look, when you're very small, you know, I started fulfilling boxes out of my bedroom and then, you know, spare room in my apartment. And, um, you know, and, and so when you're very small, you can do it. When you're very large, you know, it probably gets a lot more complicated, but then you have a lot more money to solve the problems. I think there's this spot in the middle um, where it's just like a constant headache, <laughs> which is probably where we are. Um, and, uh, you know, forecasting becomes really challenging because of course you don't want to buy too much, but you don't want to run out and stock out. Um, so very much, if you're not comfortable with spreadsheets and numbers and data, um, that's a really good place to maybe look at, you know, hiring um, an experienced consultant to help you think about how to forecast um, if that's becoming a problem for you, because it is challenging. Um, and it's a lot of math and it's a lot of numbers and a lot of data. And so, you, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, I would suggest finding someone who is to help you out because um, it's probably a couple hours, you know, every few months. And that can be really, really valuable. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, um, how about um, um, what challenges have you faced, uh, especially in, in light of the pandemics um, related to logistics? Well, Julie said uh, a lot of things that definitely resonated with me, but we have kind of two arms with logistics. We have the manufacturing of our product, which does not happen in America. It happens in Portugal and in China and that logistics nightmare. And then we have the shipping to customers, particularly shipping internationally, uh, that particular nightmare. So this earlier this year, we, we, <laughs> We onboarded two new factories. We lost our manufacturing entirely um, in about in March. And so we've onboarded two new factories and retooled and, and somehow managed to get product in production this year. But it's taking just significantly longer because it's it's a whole ecosystem. It's not just the footwear factory that makes the shoes, it's also all of their suppliers who are impacted by COVID in different countries. Uh, so Portugal is, is impacted in a different way at this particular moment than China is, but it's just taking significantly longer. Um, sea freight is taking a long time and air freight is fast, but it's going to be, I haven't gotten the bill yet, but it's going to be really, really expensive simply because there are fewer flights happening. So airspace, um, 
air freight space is more limited, therefore it is going to be more expensive. I, I'm not looking forward to that. On the customer side of it, um, I'm not going to say the customer always blames the company for slow shipping through USPS, UPS, or FedEx, or whatever, but most of them do. Uh, we're the ones that get the angry emails, and so earlier this year, not too long ago, UPS's um, problems caused by various whatever you want to think that was caused by, um, it definitely hit small companies like, like ours. Um, packages that were getting lost, packages that were just taking a long time, packages that were being bounced. Um, the cost of shipping has gone up. Cost of international shipping has gone up. Uh, our UK customers in particular are paying like five times what they were just a couple years ago. I mean, it is rough. And to kind of combat that, we have two European, um, I don't want to call them distributors. They're very, very small companies. They, they're not selling a lot of our product, but they are sort of easing that burden, but we don't make great margin there. And so our solution to that particular problem with, with European uh, shipping is we're opening 3PL in Europe next year. We're in the process of going to 3PL in the States um, now to help handle the volume coming in by Christmas. So we're going to, we've been talking to Rocket 3PL here in town. Julie, you said the the in-between size where it's just a pain in the ass to, <laughs> to fulfill. We've been fulfilling for, you know, for 10 years. Uh, we have a 5,000 square foot warehouse full of shoe boxes, but it's just too much. It's just too much now. So we're at the size where we do need some sort of, some sort of fulfillment solution. Uh, so that's what we're moving to we're in the process of it like today. <laughs> so, 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 some growing pain. And, and yeah. Cindy, um, your product is made in the US. Um, I don't know if you have some of the similar challenges or different challenges. Yeah, our, our products actually are, are not made in the US. They're made in either um, uh, Mexico or Italy currently. Um, and yeah, we've had a lot of pandemic related um, issues, the slow shipping, like, <laughs> like Lauren just mentioned, um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, UPS or USPS losing a package. It's, you know, at the end of the day, it's our, it's our fault. And for a company that, you know, we're, we're putting the customer experience uh, first, you know, we, we need to figure that out. And so there was a lot that we did earlier this summer um, to try to address uh, some of that shipping issue, we we you know got this sort of fancy expensive app that helps us monitor shipments um, to be able to see. Well, this this one looks like it just sort of disappeared in the tracking. You know, let's send another one. Uh, we extended our trial period, so it's it's a bit longer um, just to you know give packages a little bit more time to arrive and make sure people have enough time to try the the product. Um, and we we also um, uh, in terms of logistics on the manufacturing side, we we had a variety of issues this past summer. Um, we were supposed to launch a new product at the end of the summer, and that didn't end up happening because the raw materials are materials that are also used in personal protective equipment, and so those are rightly you know going towards PPE right now. Um, and uh, and the materials that are available are astronomically expensive, um, and uh, the product that we did end up launching um, this summer, which is a, a feminine cleansing cloth, um, that one actually was also delayed. There was an outbreak of COVID at the at the manufacturing facility um, where it was made, and so it, you know we had to sort of put everything on pause and make sure everybody was sort of healthy and and um, and everything before resuming that. So it's it's been kind of a it's been kind of a wild summer. I felt very much like I was kind of in defense mode, <laughs> you know, tackling some of these pandemic related problems. Great. Yeah. So we're coming up uh, at two o'clock. So let, um, we want to finish this in the next uh, couple minutes. So uh, Ray, tell us about your challenges quickly. Uh, well, I would say that we are experiencing a lot of the same. Um, about half of our um, orders are fulfilled by Amazon directly, like those are orders direct through Amazon. Uh, but then we have about half that we're doing ourselves. So, you know, anywhere in the neighborhood of 100, 150 orders a day. Um, it's pretty challenging uh, <laughs> to fulfill everything. So we're actively working on that. Um, Globally, we do utilize Amazon currently for fulfilling um, outside of the U.S. whenever possible in the locations that we do have inventory. We are also looking at 3PLs, though, as well. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I think even with Amazon, they uh, uh, had a lot of angry customers because they didn't get their two-day uh, shipping. So um, it is now two o'clock, so I wanted to do a lightning round. Um, so um, if you, each of you could just tell us what do you think will be the biggest trend or disruption in e-commerce in the next five years? So um, we'll start with Sydney. Sure, so um, I think I don't have a specific, it's not specific, but I think something related to Amazon. I, I, I think that Amazon in a way is sort of ripe for disruption. I know that sounds crazy because they're, they're a behemoth, but I just, I think a lot of consumers are starting to care more where their dollars are going. There's this antitrust movement. Um, uh, we also sell our products on, on Amazon and uh, it's a total, it's a total nightmare as a seller. And I think if there was an alternative, a lot of people would take it. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Ray? What do you think it will be the biggest trend or disruption in e-commerce? Uh, I actually agree with Sydney that there's definitely going to be some issues with regard to Amazon. Um, the lack of trust is certainly going to be a problem. I think that with companies putting out there just whatever, I mean, you've got fake brands out there, man, and they're just, they're just selling whatever rando products that they can to make a buck and then they disappear. So I think that we're going to start seeing the importance of, you know, the personal stories and understanding who's behind the brand. You know, it was a trend a couple of years ago, of like, oh, tell your story, tell your story. But I think that knowing who you're buying from is going to become increasingly important. And um, whether it be through Amazon, which is still possible, but I think even more so outside of that, I mean, even notice Amazon advertising, they're trying to show off the small businesses that they're supporting, right? Which is like a tiny part yeah so yeah so not just knowing your customer but in this case actually knowing who you're buying your products from uh, lauren what do you think is the biggest trend or disruption in e-commerce this is a really hard question um i think social media is going to change a lot i think the documentary the social dilemma has been very impactful and the way in which people are connecting through social media or not connecting through social media is going to change e-commerce. My business is built on social. I have to stay on trend with where customers are interacting online. I mentioned YouTube. I don't have a great presence on YouTube. I kind of hate YouTube, but I have to do it for my business. Uh, I think that Facebook is sort of falling by the wayside as people assess its impact on mental health, politics, that sort of thing, um, invasion into our lives. I think there's going to be change around how invasive social media is. I, I think we all have a love and hate relationship with social media, and I think that's going to continue to evolve. So Julie, um, your prediction? Yeah, I'm glad I didn't have to go first because it is a hard question. Um, I think, you know, eventually the pandemic is going to be over, um, but I don't think that people are going to return to brick and mortar uh, in the way that it, I don't think brick and mortar is ever going to look like it did before. Um, I think people are making a shift to online, and I think a lot of that's going to be a real lasting shift. And so I think the innovation is going to come in how do we create online shopping experiences for products that haven't um, been sold or sold well online in the past. And I think browsing, like, you know, browsing is going to be a huge opportunity. Like, how do you browse product catalogs? How do you, so I think that's where I am. I suspect a lot of innovation is going to happen in those areas. Great. Thank you. Well, it is 204. So I want to thank all the panelists uh, for sharing your story and your insight. And for all of you who join us today, uh, if you'd like to get notified of our future events, um, you can contact the Innovation Center. Uh, the contact information is in the chat room. Again, thank you all and have a great afternoon.